Tonight we have two uh, uh, very, very interesting speakers. When we first started putting this program uh, series together, we had uh, there were several speakers that, that we had in mind almost from the beginning. Among them was uh, Edward Robinson. Uh, I encountered uh, Dr. Robinson's book on African Americans in the uh, Church of Christ in Texas uh, almost shortly after I moved here. It was one of the first books in, on Texas history that uh, I ran into as I began to gather materials on the religious history of the state. And, uh, our little program committee uh, <clears throat> sort of agreed that he should be one of the people we invite. Uh, and I was very, very happy when he agreed to be with us. Now, uh, <clears throat> one of the things I learned tonight is that it was a slight mistake in, the, in, the, in our uh, brochure. Uh, when uh, I encountered Dr. Robinson, he was uh, still at Abilene Christian, but he's now moved to Southwestern Christian College, uh, where he went to college himself, where he's teaching uh, Bible and uh, history. Uh, but we are very, very happy to have him uh, be with us tonight, and he will uh, bring our opening uh, presentation, Fight His Own in Texas, African American in the Churches of Christ. So welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. Really appreciate the invitation to come and be with you on this evening. The fight is on in Texas. African American Churches of Christ in the Lone Star State. In 1884, when David Lipscomb, premier editor of the Gospel Advocate, observed that a, quote, Tennessean may always feel at home in Texas, end of quote, he unknowingly foreshadowed the success that black evangelists and churches of Christ from the volunteer state would enjoy in the Lone Star State. A handful of African-American preachers who left enduring legacies in Texas hailed from Tennessee. These evangelists, among others, included John T. Ramsey, Marshall Keeble, and G.P. Bowser. In 1916, John T. Ramsey, an African-American evangelist from T Tennessee, reported on his promising evangelistic work in the Lone Star State, observing, quote, there are but few loyal brethren out in this part of Texas, so you can see that the fight is on out west." End of quote. That's where I got that title from. That statement really caught my attention. The fight is on out west. Ramsey's statement reflected the feisty mentality that gripped the hearts and souls of black preachers and churches of Christ. African American churches of Christ mirrored this combative disposition in their sermons writings, debates, and dealings with their religious neighbors who held different theological perspectives. As they waged war against black Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, Pentecostals, and others, they contested as well the biblical views and practices of their African American brethren among the disciples of Christ or the Christian church. Black churches of Christ descended from the 19th century religious reform effort termed the Stone Campbell Movement. Even though Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell focused on Christian unity, by the early 20th century, the fellowship had fractured. It had divided. Over such issues as the use of instrumental music and worship and extra congregational organizations. African American Churches of Christ in Texas, consequently, inherited the quote-unquote fighting style from their loyal white cohorts, especially the Churches of Christ that sprang up in the Lone Star State. One historian has noted that, quote, nowhere among Churches of Christ did the legalistic tradition more thoroughly join itself to the scalding style than in Texas. 
This is not to say that Texas was altogether lacking grace-oriented leaders. My point here is simply to say that the Texas experience contributed to the hard legalistic side of Churches of Christ in significant ways." End of quote. Black Churches of Christ in the Lone Star State, often under the tutelage of white brethren, similarly imbibed and zealously advanced a contentious disposition when dealing with black denominations. Tonight's presentation uh, chronicles the efforts of African American Churches of Christ who joined John T. Ramsey's fight out west and who helped make black churches of Christ in Texas what they are today. I want to first of all begin uh, looking at the mother church. The mother church. The mother church for African American churches of Christ is the Antioch Church of Christ in Midway, Texas. Uh, this uh, congregation was born in 1865, shortly after the Civil War, on a plantation of Hugh L. Hayes. There were several African American families who emerged from this plantation and helped to leave an indelible mark on the history of African American Churches of Christ. Midway, Texas, for those who may not know, is in Madison County. That's uh, approximately 103 miles north of Houston, Texas. This is a historical marker, and that's uh, me, of course, standing beside that historical marker. And this uh, congregation is still alive and well, thriving as uh, many of the descendants um, still live in the area and still uh, worship at that particular congregation. Some uh, in fact, the minister of this congregation lives in Houston and drives back every week to preach to uh, the congregation there. Notice, notice the name here, Antioch Church of Christ. Of course, that uh, name is taken from the biblical text in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so, uh, again, churches of Christ determined to adhere to biblical teachings, uh, attach such names uh, to their uh, particular congregations. I want to highlight uh, some of the uh, men who uh, emerged from this congregation, uh, four of them in particular, but I'm going to, there, there were many others, but I'm going to highlight just, just a few of them. Uh, Mac Allen Bailey uh, emerged from the Antioch congregation and helped to uh, plant a congregation in Riverside, uh, Texas. Jesse Warwick helped to plant congregations in Brownwood, uh, Texas, as well as Coleman in Fort Stockton, Texas. Uh, William M. Childress uh, was also a product of the Antioch congregation, and he uh, served congregations in Dallas, in Houston, uh, Jasper, as well as Palestine, Texas. Of these four individuals, uh, I contend that Francis Frank Carson was without question the most influential of the black preachers to emerge from the Antioch congregation. His journey uh, into the Churches of Christ is quite interesting because if you know anything about the history of Churches of Christ, there's a lot of tension between not just Churches of Christ and other religious groups but also within the Stone Campbell movement itself. Disciples of Christ, uh, those who practice um, worshiping with instruments and music, and of course Churches of Christ being uh, mostly a cappella. There's a lot of tension there. And so uh, the line of demarcation was not actually drawn until the latter part of the 19th century, and particularly in the early part of the 20th century. And I uh, delineate this in, in, in my book on um, the fight is on in Texas, okay? F.F. F. Carson came under the influence of both uh, William M. Childress and K.C. Thomas. It's interesting that Carson studied at Jarvis Christian College in, in Hawkins, Texas. Jarvis, how many of you are familiar with uh, Jarvis uh, Christian College, a small, uh, predominantly African-American school that's connected to disciples of Christ? And notice the date here, 1926, there was no school 
um, under the auspices of Black Churches of Christ at this time. And of course, um, educational institutions, uh, particularly those of higher learning, um, were not open to African Americans um, in the state. So he, he went to Jarvis Christian College, a Disciples of Christ School, and here's a statement that he uh, made here in Christian Echo 1940. He says, quote, I got on the wrong side of the fence thinking that the Christian church and the church of Christ were the same. But when I went home, yes, when I went home, you know the rest. And by going home, he's talking about he found the quote unquote right church and aligned himself with, with the churches of Christ, a cappella churches of Christ. And there's a, a picture of him there, Francis uh, uh, Frank Carson, again, a product of the Antioch uh, congregation, the mother church of African American churches of Christ in Texas, right? Uh, Carson preached his first sermon at the Lawrence and Martyr uh, Church of Christ, one of the oldest black uh, churches of Christ in the city of Dallas. And from there, he moved on to serve other congregations in Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, and he did some of his most impressive work uh, in California, particularly with the Southside Church of Christ in Richmond, uh, California. How many of you are familiar with uh, the movie Coach Carter? Have you seen that movie? Uh, that's situated in this context here. So he was there as a minister uh, when, of course, a lot of the, the uh, social turbulence uh, uh, took place in Richmond, California. But this gentleman is also significant because he possessed a global perspective in that uh, he was not just interested in evangelizing uh, African Americans and his respective communities, but he wanted to, he looked abroad. And, I, and that's, that's quite uh, significant there. And I, I believe more research needs to be done uh, on the uh, thrust that blacks and churches of Christ had toward reaching beyond the borders of this country. Just want to highlight a few other individuals who emerged from the uh, mother church, the Antioch Congregation, German McGilbra, established what is now the Dallas West Church of Christ, uh, a church uh, that is uh, still alive and well. And then the Nixon Bacchus family um, emerged from the Antioch Congregation as well. And you have some preachers there. Um, Kermit Nixon I had the chance of meeting. Wado Nixon I have uh, met and actually I consider him a friend. Uh, Carl Backus uh, who uh, preaches uh, in Southern California. And there's a uh, uh, Wado Nixon who preaches in uh, for Church of Christ in Enos, Texas. And there's Carl Backus who is a minister uh, to a Church of Christ in Southern California, the South Side. Church of Christ there. But again, the significance of these two men is that they emerged from the mother church, the Antioch Church of Christ in, uh, in Midway, Texas. Okay? As we proceed, I want to look at some of the, some of the early, uh, I call them seed planters, uh, in the early origins of, of Churches of Christ in the early 20th century. Uh, there were four individuals in particular who helped uh, to blaze the trail, if you will. And these were four uh, courageous preachers who toiled uh, in the Lone Star State and planted the seeds of the pure gospel. That, that's actually the phrase that they use, the pure gospel, meaning in their minds that uh, it was um, empty of any kind of uh, extra a human or man-made uh, traditions or practices, okay? And one of these individuals, as I've already mentioned him, John T. Ramsey, who came from the state of Tennessee to Texas as early as 1913. S. Orcasius, whom I actually did my dissertation on uh, at Mississippi State University and had um, um, my first book published on him in 2007 by the uh, University of Alabama Press, and also had an anthology of his work. Uh, a former slave from Prince William County, Virginia, uh, who was uh, from a biracial relationship. His, his uh, owner was a white man, his uh, mother was black, and he converted to the Stone Campbell Movement in Indiana, in Brazil, Indiana, made his way to Oklahoma uh, among the few blacks 
who resided in Oklahoma before Oklahoma became a state in 1907. But he was also active in a lot of uh, church planting and came to Texas as early as 1915. T.H. Merchant uh, from Arkansas established what is now the Allen Church of Christ in Fort Worth, Texas, a congregation that's live and well. And then K.C. Thomas, K.C. Thomas, uh, whom I have a chapter on it in my text on um, the, the fight is on in Texas. He was from Oklahoma and established the oldest uh, black congregations in the, in the city of Dallas, the Cedar Crest Church of Christ in, in Dallas, Texas, alive and well, and then the Lawrence and Martyr Church of Christ. Uh, uh, these are referred to them as hard fighting soldiers. That's a, a song, by the way, that, uh, that's still quite popular in the context of black churches of Christ. Uh, here's a quote. Uh, some of the white leaders who supported uh, Casey Thomas and his evangelistic endeavors uh, had this to say about him in the firm foundation. Uh, quote, we, we have found him to be clean, reliable, and honest. Okay? In, in all his dealings, in all our dealings with him, he has shown himself worthy of our confidence. We are anticipating his doing a still greater work among his people. Okay, and a uh, significant quote from a significant publication, the Firm Foundation was established in 1884 here in the state of Texas by Austin McGarry. It was established to, uh, as a counterbalance to the Gospel Advocate, which was edited by David Lipscomb in Nashville, Tennessee. In the mind of Austin McGarry, David Lipscomb was a little too open, a little too uh, cordial in his relations with other religious groups, uh, while the editor of the Firm Foundation was more exclusivistic and more iconoclastic uh, in his uh, treatment of other uh, religious groups. And so a very significant publication here. But the statement is quite enlightening as well because it gives us some ideal. You know, when it says he's clean, reliable, and honest, white leaders in the Jim Crow South would not have supported a black preacher had he not, quote unquote, remained in his place. And we can perhaps talk a little bit more about that uh, as we move forward this evening, all right? Now, here's the, if there is a so-called MVP, the MVP of black uh, Church of Christ preachers, is ha it has to be this guy right here. And so I have a chapter, uh, The Keeble Invasion, The Keeble Invasion. I make the argument that black churches of Christ in Texas took no viable or vibrant form until the advent of Marshall Keeble in 1929, in 1929. And I think this is a very a noteworthy individual to say the least. <clears throat> uh, Marshall Keeble was without question the premier evangelist perhaps black or white in Churches of Christ. A native of Tennessee, a descendant of slaves. He was a, a masterful storyteller, um, a practical preacher who really connected with people, uh, both black and white. And I just want to read a quote here, uh, which one of, the, one of his white supporters uh, said. I, I just want to share this with you. I think it's somewhat insightful. And it tells us also something about his combative disposition as well as uh, his uh, theological stance toward other religious groups. He, referring to Marshall Keeble, held an open invitation to anyone to show that he was teaching error. Uh, from, from the beginning to the close of the meeting, uh, three made an effort to take him down, but all in vain. The first Christian preacher uh, here tried him one night, but he had business out of town. A Baptist preacher tried him, and Keeble made him deny his doctrine, and many of his members fell out with him and obeyed the gospel as a result. A high-powered holiness was imported from San Antonio to handle the unruly condition, but he failed before he ever mounted the pulpit. His ability was less than the others that tried to put him out. Keeble is a power with the gospel sword. He is humble and knows his place and keeps it at all times. He refuses to be flattered by nice things said about his ability. He is cool and deliberate at all times. 
He was never confused even when they would rise up in the audience and call his hand. He always had a correct reply the very moment his hand was called. And this is a, a, a statement made by R.L. Colley, a white minister in Paris, Texas. This is where Keeble was preaching at the time. But again, it, it tells us not only something about Keeble's combative, combative uh, and belligerent stance toward other religious groups, but it, it tells us something about the admiration that many white Christians held for Keeble um, in terms of his um, convictions about the, uh, the quote-unquote pure gospel. I want to share with you just some of the churches that, that, that's been documented that he established. Fifth Ward Church of Christ, uh, again, live and well, well in Houston, Texas. The first congregation he established in 1929. Uh, the 20th and Birch Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas, a congregation live and well. Uh, the Tudor Street Church of Christ in 1932. Uh, North 10th and Treadaway Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas, 1935. Thomas Boulevard uh, in uh, Port Austin. The Hood Street Church of Christ here in, here in Waco, Texas. There's a, a, a very interesting scenario about that congregation there, a history about that congregation there that Marshall Keeble helped to establish in, uh, that he did establish in 1935, that congregation is alive and well. North Tenaha Church of Christ in Tyler, Texas, uh, the Welch Street Church of Christ in Wichita Falls, Texas, and then the, Green, the Greenville, Eastside Church of Christ in Greenville, uh, Texas. And so these are uh, just a handful of the many congregations that Marshall Keeble, the, Ten the Tennessean, uh, left behind. And all of these congregations, ladies and gentlemen, are, are alive and well today. In fact, I've, I preached in most, in most of these in, 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 um, just a, as a visitor, as a visiting preacher. And, and notice the dates. Notice the dates here. Uh, you know, 1930s, okay? This is the era of the Great Depression. And I think that's quite fascinating in that, you know, white Christians found green dollars in a, in a very tough and tight economy. White Christians found green dollars to support black preachers like Keeble because on the one hand, they were genuinely concerned about the spiritual welfare of their black neighbors. On the other hand, I argue that they, they wanted to keep, again, this is the era of Jim Crow segregation, I believe that some of the philanthropy was vitiated in that some white Christians wanted their black neighbors converted to Christ to make sure that they stay in their own congregations. And so that, that's a, another point that we can perhaps talk about a little bit later. All right. Uh, Keeble, um, again, garnered uh, substantial financial support from white Christians to preach uh, to, uh, to preach in black communities. And I believe that that's largely because not only was he an amazingly talented man, uh, but he did not openly challenge the racial status quo. And, and I think we have to commend Keeble, even if he uh, perhaps, uh, quote unquote, played the game, I believe that he and other black preachers displayed a lot of great faith, uh, a lot of faith, as well as fortitude uh, when preaching in the Lone Star State. Keeble makes this observation that often when people responded to the invitation, let's say 20 people came down, if 15 of those were black people, he would make sure that he had a hand in baptizing them, but he very rarely, if any, baptized the white people because he felt that that would, that would have been stepping out of his place. Okay, that's a very interesting scenario there. And so, and keep in mind, and I, I hope I don't don't offend you with the next two um, uh, slides that I'm going to show here. But but this is merely a reminder of the context in which a black preachers uh, often toiled and labored. Uh, there's, um, there's a lynching there in Center, Texas, in in 1920. In 1920, and then of course the uh, famous uh, or infamous lynching of uh, Jesse uh, Washington here in the, the city of Waco, Texas. So when a black preacher entered a community, he had to be very careful about what he said 
And at the same time, he had to be careful about what he did. Or, and so Brother Keeble, Mr. Keeble, understood the culture of the South. And that's one of the reasons why I believe he did not, uh, he refused to baptize a lot of white people who would um, respond to his invitation. Now, Keeble did not accomplish all of his great work alone. He, he trained and mentored men to duplicate his work. And I make the argument that Luke Miller was one of his perhaps most influential protégés, uh, preaching sons, if you will. Uh, Luke Miller left an indelible mark on the history of African American Churches of Christ. And this is a young man whom Marshall Keeble converted when he was preaching in Alabama, Decatur, Alabama to be more specific, and Marshall Keeble trained him as an evangelist, and this gentleman would go on to do a lot of great work. Uh, Keeble, by the way, was not a very tall man. He was, he was relatively short. Uh, perhaps God can use short people too, amen? Okay, Marsha Keeble and Luke Miller. Um, I want to share, share with you some of the churches that Luke Miller left behind in the Lone Star State. Um, Corsicana, Texas, Luke Miller established what is now the East Side Church of Christ with 218 baptisms. A Church of Christ in Beaumont, Texas, uh, Orange, Texas, Sulphur Springs, uh, Texas, uh, 1938, uh, Bryan, Texas. Um, these congregations, too, are alive and well. And then, of course, as my home congregation that I grew up in. I'm a native of Jacksonville, Texas. Uh, the Border Street Church of Christ, now the Seminary Heights Church of Christ, was established by Luke Miller uh, in 1941. And then Cameron, Texas. I'm sure that there are others, but those are the ones that I, I have been able to document uh, that Luke Miller was able to uh, establish. And then I want to say something about the Bowser legacy, because there's a Keeble legacy, but there's also the, the legacy of G.P. Bowser. George Philip Bowser also was a native of Tennessee. Uh, he was born to formerly enslaved Africans. He grew up in the Methodist faith, and he converted to the Stone Campbell movement under the preaching of Sam Davis uh, in, in Middle Tennessee. Uh, there we are, G.P. Bowser, George Philip uh, Bowser. Um, his faithful companion was Fanny uh, Bowser. Uh, G.P. Bowser withdrew from the Christian church in Tennessee and helped to establish the mother church for black churches of Christ in general. That's a phrase that Marshall Keeble used referring to the Jackson Street Church of Christ in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, even though the Antioch Church of Christ chronologically had been established in 1865. Uh, this congregation was a little bit later, but yet Keeble called it the mother church because it it helped to birth so many leaders who went on to leave an indelible mark on African-American churches of Christ. I want to show you something here that's quite significant uh, besides the picture there of, of a younger Bowser and his wife, uh, Fanny. Okay. G.P. Bowser was well educated. Uh, he studied at Walden University in Middle Tennessee and growing up in the Methodist faith, you know, Methodist placed a lot of emphasis on, on education. And so he brought that thirst for knowledge over into Churches of Christ and established what is now the Christian Echo. And that journal, by the way, is still, still being circulated. Okay? Uh, he established uh, the Civil Point Christian Institute. This is in Civil Point, Tennessee, um, just outside of Nashville. He became principal of the Southern Practical Institute in 1920. However, the school closed abruptly when the white superintendent, C.E.W. Doris, demanded that black students enter the school through the back door. This was a common practice uh, across the South. Well, Bowser, unlike Keeble, was not willing to accept the racial status quo. Bowser vehemently denounced the practice because he deemed the action uh, one of humiliation because black students were forced to go in through the back door of their own school. And as a result, he walked away from the enterprise and the school uh, collapsed. And so a decade later, a decade later, a white preacher noted that Bowser, quote, had barely enough clothes to cover him 
and they were decidedly threadbare. And the point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that his militant stance against uh, racial discrimination, racism, cost him financial support uh, from white Christians. And so the legacy that he would leave in Texas among black churches of Christ was quite different from that of Marshall Keeble. Uh, Bowser later launched the uh, Bowser Christian Institute in Fort Smith, Arkansas. It did not last very long. However, his legacy endures in what is now my, my alma mater and where I currently uh, work. Uh, Southwestern Christian College established as the Southern Bible Institute in Fort Worth in 1848 before moving on to uh, Terrell, Texas in uh, 1949. Right? The spiritual legacy of uh, G.P. Bowser is that he too taught and trained young men to duplicate uh, his efforts, uh, R.N. Hogan, Richard Nathaniel o Hogan, a native of Arkansas, came under the influence of G.P. Bowser, and he planted several churches in the state of Texas as well, Longview, Texas, Sherman, Texas, the Laurel Street Church of Christ in uh, San Antonio, Third Ward, Gladewater, Texas, and so forth. An another noteworthy point about R.N. Hogan here is that he was a vigorous opponent of racial discrimination. So he spoke out against um, white Church of Christ schools that barred black students. And so he was instrumental in helping to crack open the doors uh, at places like ACC, uh, now Abilene Christian University, uh, Oklahoma Christian University, um, David Lipscomb University, now Lipscomb University, and, and, and other, other places. So R.N. Hogan, uh, one of the spiritual Proteges of G.P. Bowles, as well as Levi Kennedy, a native of Tennessee, accomplished a lot of his great work in the North, Chicago, Illinois in particular. Okay, and one other individual, J.S. Winston, um, a native of Arkansas, was passionate about church, about church leadership, and he also planted a number of churches in uh, the state of Texas as well. And here's a, a picture of Winston and Hogan in their younger days. Uh, they collaborated on a lot of um, evangelistic tours. And Winston is, is a noteworthy individual is that because he was one of the, the founding, um, one of the founders of Southwestern Christian College uh, because G.P. Bowser was in his declining years and, and these men really helped push the project forward, okay? As I hasten to my conclusion this evening, just to do a lot of, a little comparison here, Bowser and Keeble, Keeble and Bowser. Uh, Keeble's legacy is that uh, he reportedly, and I think these numbers are more accurate, more accurate, 25,000 or more converts. His preaching tended to be more parabolic, uh, storytelling, and so forth. He never openly challenged the racial status quo. He was uh, widely lauded and supported by white Christians. Bowser, on the other hand, was more of an educator, uh, a journalist, um, religious editor, they emphasized quoting scriptures uh, during uh, sermons, and he openly contested uh, white racism, and he was willing to work independent, for the most part, of, of, white, of white Christians. As I conclude this evening, I just want to make the point that I am keenly aware that the story of Black Churches of Christ in Texas is actually more, more broad and more complex than these two men, but I, I try to narrow uh, my presentation down to keep it manageable uh, to these two men. Both Keeble and Bowser left enduring legacies, enduring marks on the history of African American churches of Christ in the Lone Star State and beyond. Uh, the Keeble legacy and Bowser legacy converged in the state of Texas because Marshall Keeble presided over a small school in Tennessee, the Nashville Christian Institute. That's what NCI stands for. It was a K through 12 school. And as young men finished that school and women, uh, he funneled those students on to um, SWCC in Texas. And so I can I actually stand here today in many ways as representative of both legacies and that my home congregation was established by a man whom Marshall Keeble converted, Luke Miller, 
And then when I was a student at Southwestern Christian College, I received the G.P. Bowser Preaching Award. I think that's pretty, pretty interesting there. So, and because of the labors of the foregoing men, uh, there are more churches of African American churches of Christ in Texas than any other state in the union. And I believe that uh, much of the credit, not all, but much of the credit uh, should go uh, to these men allowing the Lord to use them in, in, a, in an impressive way. Thank you for your attention this evening. A little time for questions and okay. answers. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna start off. If, if 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 I heard you correctly, yes, sir. We the African American Churches of Christ really get founded with the Antioch Church, uh, and and it is it does it exist as a kind of a sole Texas congregation for years, and and then you get this rapid expansion after World War One. That, that's a good point. Um, yes, basically that that's that's it. That um, it's there on this this plantation, and you have these um, children who grow up and become adults. And as they begin to move uh, beyond the borders of that uh, county, um, churches of Christ begin to kind of sprout sprout up in different different places. I think that's a good way of looking at it. I, I, I remember I, I went in some detail through McQueen's book on, on the black churches of yes. Texas and mm -hmm. I, I remember not seeing very many yes, churches yes, of Christ yes. or Christian churches mm -hmm. in one. Uh, they're mm -hmm. Muslim, Methodist, and Baptist. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So mm -hmm. we've got some other questions that uh, we have excited your imagination tonight to, to ask. I'm just wondering, is there a distinction? Uh, have the African American churches of Christ remained more conservative in their beliefs than, say, their white counterparts through the years? That's a very good question. I would say yes, for the most part, most African American, not all, but, but most African American churches of Christ are going to be more conservative than many of uh, their white counterparts. Now having said that, one of the points I make in the text is that there are rumblings in African American churches of Christ today, particularly here in Texas and, and other places as well, because as m more of our preachers become better trained, uh, they are beginning to question a lot of the traditional uh, views and perspectives. And so, so yes, on the one hand, um, many African American churches of Christ appear to be more conservative than a lot of our white counterparts. At the same time, you know, there, there are some, some serious rumblings uh, going on. Okay. I hope that uh, makes sense. Okay. Good question. As the civil rights movement began to to heat up, yes. how did African how did the Churches of Christ, African American Churches of Christ, react to King and to what was going on? Yes, <laughs> that's a very good question. I, I believe that the response was was somewhat divided. On on the I believe in general, African Americans were admirers of Dr. King and his efforts, and and we do know uh, that. Dr. King's attorney uh, early on, uh, the attorney for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. in 1955 was a gentleman by the name of Fred Gray. And in fact, uh, in my text here, there's a very neat picture of Marshall Keeble. Um, and he's sitting here and, two, and he's flanked by four young men. And one of those young men is Fred Gray. Fred Gray went on to law school and was, was attorney for Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. So you, there was an African American presence uh, from Churches of Christ, but, we, but it was not as expansive compared to Baptists and Methodists. And I think a lot of that had to do with the theological exclusivism 
um, that many African American churches Christ espouse. And I've also learned, and that's why uh, the, the piece on F.F. Carson is quite significant. In the 1960s, many African Americans in Churches of Christ began to turn their attention abroad. Uh, they're concerned about winning souls abroad. And therefore, there's not a whole lot that's being written and said and done um, um, in regards to the civil rights movement. Um, but so that, that's a very, and I think that's, that's fertile ground, in my opinion, for more research. I'm hoping to encourage some young men to, or women to explore that. Yeah. Good, good question. Yes. Do you expand a little bit on the role of Fanny Bowser? Okay, say it again? Do you expand a little bit on Fanny Bowser's role? Okay. A, a Bowser's role? Fanny. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Oh, very good point. Very good point. Yes, uh, she was uh, without question a, a staunch supporter uh, of, his, of his ministry, of, of his efforts. And I recently published a book, ACU Press. Uh, on a lady by the name of Annie C. Tuggle. And I mentioned her because she was a good friend of Fanny Bowser. And one of, the, one of her flaws was that she tended to have a, a heated temper. And she, she tended to be impatient. And so, um, so on the one hand, that, that was something, you know, if she didn't like something, uh, she, she was not bashful about letting her husband know about it. And so, um, but for the most part, she was, she was highly um, energetic and supportive, you know, as he launched the different schools. Um, she was right there, there by his side. Now, as you saw in the presentation, those schools collapsed. And I, and I no doubt believe that that took a toll on her physically as well as emotionally. And so she will, she will actually die before he will. He, he dies in... Uh, 19, Bowser dies in 1950, uh, 1950, and so, but she died shortly before he did, and he remarried again, and I believe the woman he married was not a, a good match for him. But, but Fanny Bowser was a definitely a, a, a committed, dedicated supporter of his, of his efforts. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.